So I want to talk about sort of the, the mathematics a little more carefully around a latch structure. Um, I want to be able to do this in a way that we can kind of just walk through what is a classic structure, which is typically a structure something of this sort, where I imagine I have two input currents that are being defined, they're coming from somewhere. Likely they're coming from two other MOSFETs that are probably have two other voltages that I'm comparing. But let's start from the currents. And typically this is going to have this very strange looking structure, if you haven't seen it before, that almost looks like I take two MOSFETs and I've done sort of the typical diode connected where the gate and the drain are connected together. But in this case, I've actually connected them to the opposite devices, which seems a little strange. One way to think about it is if I look from this element, you know, from here to the out, this output node, that looks like a common source element that has an inverting gain. Well, if this switch were closed, then it's going to connect to the other, well, if it's open, this will then connect to the other gate, which is a common source structure, which also has an inverting gain, and it's much greater than one. Very quickly you realize this structure is actually not stable, but very much will want to push you either one side or the other. So this is very much what you're asking for for a comparison. You want to know if there's any differences in the two voltages, which would be implied by the difference of the currents. Granted, there's some issues that can happen with mismatch, but Let's argue for a moment that things are matched. Any difference in the current will move me in one direction or the other. So this gives me some really interesting sort of capabilities here. It also means that if it's going to get stuck in one side or the other, I often want to set this to the structure in a particular place to make sure that it starts off like at, at its midpoint and then whatever shift in the current is, I can move it from there. And so often you'll have sort of a reset kind of structure where under reset, this will then short and close. And then I lift up the reset and the dynamics happen from there. Well, now if I wanted to actually figure out what is the, the structure, you know, without the switch itself, the dynamics of the switch, I know that I can just write the differential equations. I've got V out and then V out two, one and two here. That makes this kind of interesting. Now there are capacitors at these nodes so we'll just work with it. We'll just assume there's always a path. If you're not familiar with this by now, it's important to remember that no matter what nodes you make, you're going to get capacitance. You're going to get capacitance to fix potential just by simply making wires. So there's always some, and almost always there's something intentional there. So we're going to assume we have two capacitors that are, in, that are intentional. They don't have to necessarily be large. One can do a whole range of things for that design. And this would be the structure you would build. Okay, so when the outputs are equal, which typically will be the case when you reset the switch, because after all, I'm shorting them, um, an easy way to look at this is that these are all going to be equal, so I could actually just like sum these up, or I could put things in together, or, but I know I'm going to have both of the input currents, and so if I add them together, I'll get the, the combined effect, the combined capacitance, the combined transistors. And in fact, I get a very nice stable structure that's based on the common mode of those two currents. Great! This is not shocking and it's a nice stable circuit. In fact, it even gives you a very clear stable uh, starting operation where these two are equal. That's going to give you clearly a DC point to which you will build around. Great! And a bias current that's happening likely because the two of them are equals. It'll be at its common mode. Okay, this, is, this, this gives us a lot of our framework, not only to say here's what it works when I have the reset set, but it also gives me the structures of which I'm going to move around. So it gives me my starting points for the main differential equations. Because I can take these two and then take the difference of them, which is much more interesting when the reset now gets disconnected, when it's now disconnected or the switch is open. At that point, what happens? Well, now I take the difference of it, I see the difference of the two outputs, I see the difference of the exponentials and the difference of the current. Well, assuming that my, my output is sort of a typical half, you know, I'm looking at the half of the difference, I can look at my change, and remember, this is my change around the bias points. Again, change is going to be the difference anyway, so it's still pretty easy to see. But it's going to be that I'm going to have a bias current over 2, 
because technically I'm going to have an extra two that floats in from there, so that's where it's going to come across. And I get this element and this element. So I get sort of half of the difference, which again, typical differential kind of mode. And then I see here this difference over two. Well, that's also known as a hyperbolic cinch and probably easier to conceptualize what, that is, what that's doing. But it actually gives a minus sign because it's a minus minus the plus side. So it's flipped. And so this is actually the full nonlinear dynamics of this structure. And you might think, well, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And you might be able to see things. But to illustrate a little bit clearer what goes on, what goes on in the structure here when the switch is completely disconnected, is you end up seeing that, okay, well, the cinch, when it's really close, and for small values, it's good, they're going to be close, right? So that small value, cinch of x is approximately x. So let me just take the thing in the argument, because I can do this. Similar to tanch, so of course, cinch has a different type of nonlinearity, but same idea. And what I get here is I get, you know, this sort of, this initial term here and the current. That gives me this particular, so let me then create a time constant tau, get back to that in a second, gives me something related to the proportional change of the inputs over the initial bias current. What was the bias current? Well, think about it, it was actually the sum of these. So everything is kind of normalized in a fairly reasonable place. And I've got this positive feedback dynamics, which means that I'm going to go from a small value and I'm going to explode exponentially. And at what speed will that happen? Well, the speed that happens is the time constant, which is related to the capacitance, ut, because again, we're dealing with subthreshold. There's an above threshold version of this, and you can do the same kind of math over kappa times the bias current. And now the bias current is related to the input currents, and that might be a bias, it might be a bunch of things. But depending on how I set that determines the speed, or in some sense also determines the efficiency depending on what bias current I choose in a particular problem. Now typically if I'm building a comparator, I might not want the capacitance to be any bigger than I have to, because I probably want it to go as fast as it could uh, and then in so doing, therefore, I can use the minimum amount of bias current to, to go as fast as possible. But this is kind of how you get this positive feedback dynamics out of the structure. And it's kind of helpful to see it not just in its linear form, but also in the nonlinear form. It's because if you need to deal with very, very large kinds of structures, these kind of questions may turn out to be important.